Hello everyone, I'm History with Matt. What if I told you there was a member of the Nazi SS who later worked for the Israeli Mossad? Well, you'd probably call me either high as a kite or an exceptional fiction writer. What if I told you for one man, this was all true? Otto Skorzeny, once labelled the most dangerous man in Europe, who was later a farmer in County Kildare, Ireland, and then agent for Mossad. As always, if you like these videos, like and subscribe, and let's get into it. Born the 12th of July 1908, he grew up in Vienna, Austria. He developed a fascination with, Europe with military history and a love for the art of fencing, of which, in the Vienna Institute of Technology where he studied, he was engaged in a fencing match that left him with a prominent scar on his cheek that would be the defining facial feature for the rest of his life. The scar is called a Schmisch in German, which was seen as a badge of honour and a sight of bravery among upper-class Germans and Austrians in fencing. In May 1932, Skorzeny joined the Austrian Nazi organisation and soon became a member of the Austrian branch of the Storm at Tailung, the SA. Standing in around 6 foot 4, his imposing height led him to be a popular guy in the SA. He either got his degree and worked as a civil engineer. After the Anschluss of Austria and World War II happening soon after, Skorzeny volunteered to serve in the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. However, being 31 years old and 6 foot 4, he did not meet the requirements, as can you imagine him fitting in a Messerschmitt 109? After this rejection, he did the only logical thing at the time, and joined the SS, where he trained in Hitler's personal bodyguard regiment. He fought in France, the Netherlands, and gained notoriety for capturing a large group of Yugoslav troops. For this action, he was promoted to first lieutenant, or in SS terms, Obersturmfuhrer. With Operation Barbarossa being launched against the Soviet Union in 1941, Skorzeny was sent to the Eastern Front with the SS Division Das Reich. As a former civil engineer, Skorzeny was put in charge of German troops who were to seize strategic buildings in Moscow as, as it was after it was taken, like the NKVD headquarters, which was the Soviet secret police, and the Central Telegraph Office. However, after German troops failed to capture the Moscow, this mission was cancelled. After being hit in the back of the head by shrapnel, he was sent back to Vienna to recover from his injuries in which he was awarded the Iron Cross second class. In Vienna, he didn't do much wrestling, however. He instead devoted his time into researching commando tactics and unconventional warfare. He wrote proposals like fighting behind enemy lines, using enemy troop, enemy uniforms, and waging sabotage attacks to slow down the enemy. His proposals were noticed by Nazi bigwigs, big wigs, like Ernst Kaltenbrunner, head of the Reich Main Security Office and successor to Reinhard Heydrich, he passed his ideas to Walter Scheltenberg, head of SS Foreign Intelligence, in which Scheltenberg created the Commando SS Unit, the Sonderband SZBV Friedenthal, in which Skorzeny would be its commander. His first operation as leader of this unit would be Operation Swan Francois in 1943, in which the group would be parachuted into Iran to convince, to convince the local Kashke people to rise up against the British, as this would distract the Allies. However, this would be a massive failure, as the troops were given gold in an attempt to bribe the trial leaders. However, Paul Ernst Feckenheim, an Anverian agent, who was also a Jewish, who was also Jewish, and was previously detained in Dachau concentration camp until he was recruited to be a German spy in Palestine, which I had to include as I find it very interesting, remarked that once the group ran out of gold, the Kashke handed them over to the British. However, Skorzeny was not deterred by this failure and had his first and most notable success that was Operation Oak in, 1940, in September 1943, where Scorzini and his men liberated Benito Mussolini after he was deposed and arrested by King Emmanuel III, mainly due to Italy being invaded by the Allies. This was no easy task as Mussolini was constantly being moved around, but after a mes message was intercepted, it was found that Mussolini was being held in Campo Imper Imperato Hotel, a remote resort near 7,000 feet in the air, in the Grand Sasso mountain range, which was only accessible by cable car. Scorzini, along with Luftwaffe General Kurt Student and Major General Otto Harald Moores, commander for Paratroop Division, devised a plan, in which a hundred of his commandos, including himself, would land at the hotel and gliders. The plan almost ended his failure, as the group had miscalculated how much flat ground there was, and Scorzini's glider near crashed. However, he got out and continued with the mission. Ten minutes later, Skorzeny and his men had overwhelmed the guards and had Mussolini. 
They were helped by Italian general Fernando Soletto, who had travelled with Scorzani and ordered the Italian troops to stand down. Hitler, who had ordered the launch, was delighted with Scorzani and awarded him the Knight's Cross and had made him his favourite commando. As a result of this daring raid, he was labelled by the Allies the most dangerous man in Europe. As a result of his actions in Operation Oak, propaganda films were made where Scorzani deliberately always had himself placed in front and centre, and to be the one escorting Mussolini. Scorzani's alleged next mission would be Operation Long Jump, where Weiss, Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin were all at the Tehran Conference. They would attempt to kill or capture all three of them, where a group of six German commandos were sent to Iran. However, SS officer Ulrich von Otto, while drunk, discussed the plans unknowingly to a Soviet spy. Roosevelt and Churchill were informed of the plot and were kept in the Soviet embassy where the NKVD seized the, Germ- seized the German commandos who were forced to radio Skorzeny that the mission was over. However, this plot allegedly never happened and was used by the Soviets to, to, to use as a propaganda victory and also to listen to the Allied leaders while they were in the Soviet embassy. Skorzeny himself said that the operation had never existed and stated that the Soviets tied his name to it to give the story credibility as a renowned SS commando would make it seem more plausible. Skorzeny was then tasked with capturing Yugoslav partisan leader Joseph Bros Tito, in Operation Night Sleep. In the raid on Davar, a small Bosnian town close to where Tito's headquarters was, Skorzeny's commandos attacked by gliders while the Wehrmacht attacked on the ground. The partisan leaders fought back ferociously, allowing Tito to escape. Skorzeny would have another personal success after the attempted bombing on Hitler on the 20th of July 1944 by Klaus von Stauffenberg and his co-conspirators who planted the bomb at the Wolf's Lair in order to kill Hitler. Scorzini himself says that he played a large part in resolving, restoring order in Berlin after Operation Valkyrie was launched by the co-conspirators, in which it was used to quell a possible uprising, but the group would use this to arrest high-level Nazis. Scorzini is said to have allegedly rescinded the order which caused confusion among the conspirators and prevented a civil war. Hitler was again impressed by Scorzini, and tasked him with Operation Panzerfaust, in which Admiral Nicholas Horthy, who was already an unwilling ally of the Nazis, had begun secret peace negotiations with the Soviets. Horthy, who had constantly been a thorn in Hitler's side, such as his refusal to have Hungarian Jews deported, and with this, Skorzeny and his men ruled into Budapest, kidnapped Horthy's son, forced him to stand down, and replacing him with a puppet government led by the Arrow Cross Party who led the deportation of around 300,000 Hungarian Jews, who would later die in death camps. After this, in December 1944, Skorzeny participated in the Battle of the Bulge, where he launched Operation Grief, where Skorzeny and his SS commandos were tasked with taking bridges along the Mezu River before they were destroyed. However, it is also how he managed to gain this infamy, is when he selected the men who were fluent in English, dressed them in American uniforms, and put them behind enemy lines, where they would sabotage supply lines and cause widespread panic, where American units would interrogate their fellow soldiers to find out if they were American. In one instance, Bernard Montgomery, the British field marshal, refused to show his ID, and was dragged from his car, tied in a barn, until his identity could be verified. Skorzeny also started a rumour that the priority of this mission was assassinating General Eisenhower in Paris, in which Eisenhower was put in effective house arrest. Though the operation failed, and many Germans were identified and shot as spies, as it was illegal under the Geneva Convention to use uh, enemy uniforms, it succeeded in causing panic and confusion in the Allied lines. As the Germans were in full retreat, and the war was effectively lost, Skorzeny became involved in Operation Werewolf, in which Hitler youth members would wage guerrilla warfare against uh, against any Allied occupation. However, Skorzeny mainly used this operation to smuggle high-ranking Nazis out of Germany. As a result of this operation, when the NKVD gained knowledge of it, they killed 5,000 boys aged 15 to 17 to prevent them from becoming guerrilla fighters. As Hitler committed suicide on the 30th of April 1945, Skorzeny, knowing the war was over, handed himself over to the Americans. Shortly after, he finished the war as a highly decorated, well-respected, even among his adversaries, military man. However, as previously mentioned, his use of American military uniforms was labelled as a war crime, which in all fairness is relatively minor considering the other things Nazis did, you know. 
He was spared in 1947 after British SOE officers confirmed that they themselves had used German uniforms. Skorzeny escaped his internment camp with two SS men who were dressed as American military police. Skorzeny later claimed that this was carried out by the OSS, the predecessor to the CIA, where he would get his freedom in exchange for his service. But this evidence is just Skorzeny's claim. After escaping the internment camp, Skorzeny hid in a farm in Bavaria, where he established connections with Reinhard Gehild and Hartmann Lackenbecker, where he helped the Gieland organisation, a group made by the Americans consisting of Nazis who would spy in the Soviet bloc countries. He then moved to Paris, Salzburg, before landing in Madrid, Spain, where he would work for Francisco Franco's intelligence service. He would later be classified and denazified by West Germany in 1952, despite never renouncing his Nazism, which allowed him to travel relatively freely in Western Europe. He was the head of a far-right security company called the Paladin Group, where the group trained Argentinian, Argentinian, Egyptian, South African and Portuguese security forces. He founded a neo-Nazi group, Sede, which was filled with ex-Nazis who published Holocaust denialism and published the works of Francis Parker York. But one of its main uses was smuggling Nazis in South America, particularly Argentina, where Scorzini would serve as a military advisor to Juan Perón and would be in his bodyguard detachment. He also lived in Ireland, strangely enough, and purchased Martinston House in Curra, County Kildare, and worked on the farm there. However, he was constantly being monitored by the G2, Ireland's intelligence services. However, he rarely interacted with the locals and sold the property in 1972, where it is still used for weddings for couples in Ireland to this day. As Skorzeny was a former SS member, and a still committed Nazi who had been involved in deporting Hungarian Jews. You'd think he'd be a goner when Mossad agents arrived at his door, but they came there to recruit them. He replied, I know who you are and why you are here. You are here to kill me. To which the Mossad agents replied, If he wanted to kill you, you'd be dead for weeks. They offered Sk- Skorzeny a deal, where he would work for them in exchange for money. Skorzeny did not care for money. He wanted to be removed from Nazi hunter Simon Wissenthal's list, in which they agreed. He was flown to Tel Aviv, where he attended a Holocaust memorial and appeared respectful. His job was to kill Heinz Krug, a Nazi scientist who had been working on developing rockets in Egypt. Skorzeny had been a military advisor in Egypt before, where he had trained troops, Egyptian troops, and he had also trained Palestinians to raid raid in the Gaza Strip. One of these Palestinians would be Yasser Arafat, who would be the leader of the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. He would keep his promise to Mossad and identify all the Nazi scientists working in Egypt as well as European companies who were selling rocket parts to it, to Egypt. Skorzeny would assassinate Krug after luring him to Munich, due to him becoming afraid of being killed. Little did he know who Skorzeny was working for. There are also rumours of Skorzeny working for the CIA, either directly or indirectly. By looking at what has been declassified in the CIA website, he was also rumoured to be a possible, possible double agent for the Soviets, specifically for Viktor Abakuyov, who is alleged to have been one, to have been one since 1944, as he was a friend with Kurt Karl Rudel, who was a Soviet spy as well. That is a rabbit hole in and of itself, so I'll briefly mention all the organisations Skorzeny worked for, both allegedly and definitively. He was an SS commando, possible Soviet double agent, an advisor for Franco Spain, Peron's Argentina, Nassar's Egypt, a Mossad, a Mossad agent and a CIA agent or informant, which is just crazy. The man worked for everyone. His CV was absolutely stacked. Otto Skorzeny met his end, not from the Soviets, not the CIA, not even Mossad. He died from lung cancer. On July the 5th, 1975, he had two funerals. One in Madrid and one in his family home in Vienna. Both were surrounded with swastikas and his friends were given the Nazi salute and singing Hitler's favourite song. And so, the most dangerous man in Europe was no more. But he should be more accurately known as the most dynamic man in Europe, for he was clearly a committed Nazi, and died one, never renouncing it at all. But it is also true that he lived multiple lives. An Irish farmer, an SS commando, a Mossad agent. He was an expert at what he did. And possibly the reason he was never killed, is no one knew who he worked for, and as he worked for everyone. If you did enjoy this video, consider liking and subscribing. I've been History with Matt, Thank you very much for watching.